Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to the STP training webinar. Our topic today is Make Your Automation Behave, Extending Your Framework for BDD. And our speaker for the day is Angie Jones. I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself uh, for about now 16 years. And I'm excited to host you all and Angie on our STP trainings. So incidentally, she's also been a speaker with us in past on SDPCon, and she's also uh, a speaker with us for our upcoming conference, Fall 2017 SDPCon, that will be held in Washington, D.C. area this September 25th to 29th. So excited about that, Angie. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I, I see you have a couple of workshops and stuff at SDPCon, you're speaking, there are a couple of uh, sessions too, so want to share what you're doing at our upcoming conference? Sure, so I'm doing a um, talk on what tests should we automate, and uh, this should be a really interesting conversation, it's going to be really interactive, because I get this question a lot from people um, who are trying to figure out their automation strategy, and the answer always depends on the context that they're in. And so we're going to walk through um, several different types of situations and look at the factors that come into play and what types of things should we look at when we're trying to determine which test should we automate. So that should be interesting. And then um, Paul Merrill and I are also doing a workshop uh, called the Dominoes of Automation. So this is a really fun, uh, lighthearted workshop around test automation, but it's filled with uh, such great nuggets of information. So really looking forward to joining you all. Oh, very nice. And welcome to this webinar too. Thanks for being our speaker today. So uh, as you can see, we have various certification courses through these dates. There are workshops through September 26th and 27th and conference sessions uh, through 28th and 29th. Uh, the there, are, there are going to be a lot of topics uh, in this uh, upcoming conference, including automation, agile, performance, DevOps, uh, the, I believe mobile and security too. Uh -huh. Then there is a lot of uh, leadership and strategy. So the whole, uh, the complete program is actually published for all of us to explore at stpcon.com. And if all of uh, any of you would like to save your dollars, like up to 400 on your registration, you could register by 26th of August. As a tester myself, uh, I really believe that conferring is one of the best ways to learn and uh, to be able to get to know other reputed testers across the globe and build network. I hope you all find it to be the same way. Uh, Angie, is there any particular uh, session that you are looking forward to at the upcoming SDPCon? Yeah, there's quite a few actually. Um, as far as workshops go, uh, I'm really looking forward to the Demystify Mobile Application Testing by Raj. So um, I just recently joined uh, Twitter and I'm doing a much more uh, complex mobile testing and automation and so I'm really looking forward to pick up some good tips and tricks um, in that workshop and then there are several talks as well my goodness the, the agenda is just packed with lots of great content um, for starters the keynote so yours and uh, Paul Grasafi's is just uh, I'm really looking forward to both of those um, you're going to talk about debugging diversity, I believe, and yeah, that's something that's near and dear to my heart. And then, then Paul's going to talk about uh, automation and judgment and responsibility, also something that I'm very passionate about. And um, I'm, I, I saw that there's Dorothy Graham on the agenda, and uh, I, I haven't met her, yeah. but I'm such a, a fangirl of hers, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, her session on Are Your Tests Well Traveled? Yes, yeah, she's going to be there. Cool. Yeah, that's really exciting. All right. So, folks, if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your uh, followers and connections across. Uh, we love the shout-outs. So if you hear something you like during Angie's webinar right now, please tweet about it and use at Software Test Pro for a retweet from us. Another quick piece of information that I have for you that is for the upcoming webinar, What is Agile Testing Anyway by Pradeepa? 
uh, Narayan Swami that will be on 12th of July. So the link is up for you to review and register. She's also been a renowned speaker and has spoken at STP in past and she's getting hugely popular amongst various testing forums and is a hands-on hands -on practitioner for Agile. So, and she's also just like Angie known to be uh, engaging heavily with her audience. So yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots of insights sharing. I hope you go for it. All right, let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome again, Angie, for you. We are very thrilled to have you here with us today. And let me do a quick small introduction for uh, all of us here of yours. So Angie Jones is a senior software engineer in test at Twitter. I think she very recently joined uh, Twitter and if she would like to share any information on that, she's uh, more than welcome to do that about her transition. Uh, she has developed automation strategies and frameworks for countless software products. And as a master in inventor, she is known for her innovative and out-of-box thinking style, which has resulted in more than 20 patented inventions in the US and China. Wow. Angie shares her wealth of knowledge by speaking and teaching at software conferences all over the world. And there is so much more I could go on and on talking about her vast experience um, and speaking across the globe and involvement with the community. But I'll let her do the rest of the talking. And just before I hand over her to start, a few housekeeping points for next one hour. All the attendees shall remain muted through the webinar. You can type in your questions, share them with us through your question or chat box, whatever appears on your version of GoToWebinar, and we shall take them up with uh, Angie after she's done with her presentation. Uh, the webinar is recorded and it will be posted on the Software Test Pro site for the attendees to go through it later, so don't worry about that. Uh, all right, so Angie, it's all yours now. Very warm welcome again, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So yes, I'm Angie Jones. I'm a senior automation engineer at Twitter and based in San Francisco, California. And today I'm going to share how to make your automation behave by extending your existing UI framework for behavior driven development or BDD. So I've consulted with quite a few teams who have adopted BDD practices and they want to reap the benefits of it within their test automation efforts. However, just about every team that I've seen take this leap has been under the impression that they need to start a brand new automation framework and abandon the one that they already have. Um, of course, this doesn't go over well with people who have spent a lot of time and investment in building up a solid framework. So I just want to go over today and let you know that this is not the case. Um, in our one hour together, I'll show you how you can utilize your current framework and sim simply extend it for BDD. So, uh, the page object model design pattern is the most common approach used in developing UI automation. So since this is the industry standard, um, I'm going to assume that this is our starting point for the purposes of this presentation. Very quickly, just in case there's anyone on the call who is not familiar with page object model, let me explain it in this one slide. So within a given project, you create classes in your framework to model the pages of the application that you're testing. The idea the idea is that each of the application, um, each of the pages of the application maps to a class within your framework. And within your class, you have objects that represent the elements of a given page. So let's say, for example, there's a form to complete on the page. Then your class may contain an object for each of the pieces of that form, such as buttons or text field, check boxes, whatever. Finally, within your class, you have methods to interact with the elements on the page. So a method to set a specific text field to some value or a method to click a certain button. Your test then uses the page objects to take actions on the UI and verify the state of the application. So today, uh, we're going to look at a framework that tests an e-commerce site. 
And let's say that one of the existing tests you have is to search for a discounted product on the site. So here we see where we make use of our page object classes to search and then validate what was returned. All right, so one day your team decides to try behavior-driven development, right? So this is where multiple people from different roles, namely the business analyst, developer, and tester, get together and discuss the feature before production begins. These, uh, this trio is commonly referred to as the three amigos. So to drive the conversation, they work together to come up with scenarios on how the feature will be used. And the scenarios are written in what's called Gherkin language. So this language allows the amigos to discuss how the feature should behave without worrying with the implementation details of the feature. So at some point, you realize that you can utilize these scenarios directly for automation. Um, Cucumber is an open source tool. It allows you to write these scenarios in what's called a feature file. And then you can tie those back to your automation code. So it's like executable test cases. So let's say the team is working on a new feature and um, they're doing BDD and you want to automate that scenario. Now remember, there's no need to throw away all of your hard work and start another framework. Here's how you can extend your existing one. As you see here, we have our page object classes. And we also have a test source folder that contains our test classes. Um, there's search test, which contains the one test that we looked at a couple of slides ago. And um, there could be hundreds of more tests in your framework, and that's perfectly fine. In fact, even better, the more that you have, the more that you have to work with. So to incorporate the scenarios that you all came up with from your BDD sessions, you can start by installing the Cucumber plugins into your workspace. And Cucumber.io has documentation on how to do this. It's really simple. It's just a matter of adding a few dependencies to your Maven or Gradle uh, setup. Next, you begin to add layers to your framework to support Cucumber and the means of packages. So the first layer is the feature files itself. So remember, this is simply the scenarios that you like to run for that feature. So here I've added the package cucumber.features um, to the test source folder. And this is where I'll add my feature files. So you can have as many feature files as you like, but let's just start with one for now. Okay, so I named this feature file search.feature to represent the functional area that it covers. So it's standard to begin your feature file with the word feature. So you see that on line one with the semicolon. And then a description of the feature you're testing. Now this part isn't used to execute any automation code, but your feature file also serves as documentation of the feature and how it behaves. So this is really useful. Next, we have a scenario that describes the behavior of the feature from the user's perspective. So this particular scenario will describe the intended behavior when a user clicks a product that has been returned in the search results. So in Gherkin, we use the given when then syntax to describe the flow of a scenario. So givens are things that describe the current state of the system before the scenario actually begins. Um, when describes the action that you're taking to invoke the test, and then describes the expected result. So as you can see here, I also used an AND on line six, um, which can be used anywhere within the flow, the AND keyword. Also notice that the scenario is nice and short. So there's no details here on how to ensure that, a, that there's a product named Apple TV, for example. There's no details here about where to click, which button to press to actually search the product. Um, there's nothing here that tells how I know if I'm taken to the product page or not. 
So this is where I see a lot of teams get hung up. Um, they're adding a lot of details, especially when testers are the main ones writing the feature files. That's why it's really helpful to write these scenarios with your business analyst because it should read at that business level, right? Not very technical. Um, testers are accustomed to writing test cases and being very explicit in the actions that are taken and what's being verified. So when they begin writing feature files, the scenarios get very long-winded. So to keep your feature files focused on the behavior and not the implementation, what you do is push the details down to the code level. So let's take a look at this. Now, each step in the scenario needs to be tied to a method in your automation code. And the code that holds these methods is known as step definitions. So I like to add another package in the test source folder called cucumber.stepdefs. Uh, and just like the package for the feature files, this can hold as many of these step definition class files as you like. Um, I've seen projects where all of the steps are dumped into one step definition file, but I strongly advise against that. Um, the reason is because things grow wild and unmanageable very quickly. And I'm a strong believer in clean and organized code, um, and test code is no exception to that. So what we're going to do here, I create one step definition class per functional area. So I'll have one for search. Now let's look at how we match each step to a method within the step definition class. So the first step in our scenario was this given step up top. So below that is the code inside of the search step def class that corresponds to it. Notice line 18 uses the annotation given, followed by a regular expression which matches the step. So when Cucumber sees given there is a product named Apple TV, in a feature file, it looks for a method that's annotated with the regular expression that matches that, and then it executes that method. Also notice on line 18, the parentheses with the dot star in the middle, that's a wild card that allows us to make our expressions even more flexible and allow for variables so that we can reuse these statements over and over again. In this case, Apple TV is the variable, and it corresponds to the argument that's in the method signature called product name. Notice also in this class on line 16, um, we have a global variable. And on line 20, we assign the value from the feature file to that global variable. Now, every variable doesn't have to be global, and I'll show you why this one is in a minute. Okay, so the next step from the feature file is, and I search for the product. Since this and line follows a given step, it's implied that this is part of the given. However, these annotations in the code, they don't really matter. So Cucumber's not really looking at um, how you use the annotations in, in the sentence that it goes with. Um, this same step could be written as part of a when statement in a previous or a future scenario. And you would still want to be able to reuse that method. So Cucumber doesn't really pay attention to, to the annotation issues. As long as you use one of the key ones, then it knows that it, um, to use that. Now looking at the body of the method, we can see the use of our page object model. So the first line of the method creates a new instance of a page, and then it uses that instance to call the search method on that page. So there was no need to create anything new. This already existed in our framework before we ever introduced Cucumber. So we're just using our step definition to make a call to what we already have. Notice that the search method needs a string to search for. In this case, we pass in that product name variable. This is the reason why we needed product name to be a global variable. So you cannot pass variables around between the steps of a scenario. So if there's anything that you need to share between multiple steps, then you need to give it a global scope so that other methods can access it. So notice here also that the search method returns a search results object. 
our later steps will need to take action on the results. So this is how we know that this object needs to also be global. Search results um, was underlined with a warning. It was telling me that the object has not been used. So this is also a good sign that, hey, maybe I need to move this to a broader scope. So let's do that. All right, so here we declare the search results globally on line 21 and then set it inside of the search method on line 32. So now any step can use that. The next line of the feature file is when I click the product. So clicking the results is something new that we have not done in any of the other tests. So this method does not exist yet in our framework. However, we can simply add it to our existing search results widget that is using the page object model. So notice we're keeping this clean. We're not directly dealing with elements in our step definitions, just like we wouldn't deal with them in our test classes if we weren't using Cucumber. So we keep it separated as normal and just make the call from the feature file. So it's simply adding an additional layer. Okay, so we took care of the missing method, but there's still some red here. So we're trying to reuse the current page object in this method, but we didn't make it global. So again, if there's a need for reuse across your steps, then the object or the variable needs to be global. So we move current page to a global scope, and then we can reuse it on line 37. Now the final step of the scenario is the validation. So the step says, then I should be taken to the product page. Notice it does not specify how do you know it's the product page. So that detail is pushed down here into the code. So the method uses the existing page object classes to get the title of the current page, which should be in the product page. Okay, so now, You've seen how to extend your existing automation framework to include scenarios created via BDD. I want to show you a few more things that you'll run into and how to make sure that you keep things nice and clean. So let's look at this new scenario. It says add a product from search result to cart. Given there is a product named Apple TV, when I search for the product and I add the product to the cart, then the product should be in the cart. Notice now I've kind of branched off into a different area of the application, the cart. Um, I don't want to add cart step definitions to my search step, step definitions um, because that makes things messy and hard to find and maintain, especially when we start adding scenarios to explicitly test the cart features. So while this feature technically spans multiple parts of the applications, I'm still going to keep my code clean. So the scenario is fine here in the search feature file because ultimately it is a search test. But I'm going to make a new step definition file called cart step def. I add it right here in the step def package and Cucumber reads all of the step definition regular expressions from all of the classes and has them in one big library, if you will. So even though we are going to have one scenario that has some steps connected to methods in the search step depths class and some steps connected to methods in the cart step depths class, Cucumber is cool with that. So it'll be able to find them just fine. So here's the cart step devs.java um, with the one method here that pertains to the cart page. So when we run that scenario, it will run the methods that it finds in search step devs as well as the method it finds in cart step devs. Um, we do have one compilation error, well, two on line 17. Um, we've talked about how you can't share data between steps without making that data global, right? Um, we fixed this very same issue in the search step depths by making product name global. 
So we were able to refer to it across any method in that class. But now that we're in another class, those same rules don't apply. So when you have data that you want to share across multiple steps that live in multiple classes, how do you handle that? So the answer is dependency injection. Dependency injection is simply the passing of a dependency to whoever needs it. So what I do is make another base step definition class that holds the global variables and objects that I need access to across multiple files. So in this particular case, product name is needed across the two other step definition files. So I make base step defs and I add the global variables here. Now that I have this stuff extracted out, I need to inject it into the classes that depends on it. So that would be the search step defs and the cart step defs. So to enable dependency injection, you first include the library in your Maven or your POM file. So there's a few options um, that you can use, Pico container, in Spring are really popular ones. Um, I'm using Pico Container for this example. Instructions on how you add these to your um, framework can be found in the documentation on cucumber.io. Um, once you do that, the rest is really simple. That part's simple too, but the rest is simple. All of it's simple. <laughs> um, so all you need to do is add a constructor to each of the dependent classes and then include the dependency as an argument into that constructor. So notice here in step, search step depths, we added a new global object on this very first line. Then we also added a constructor that takes base step depths and we assign this to our global object. Then notice in the methods, we use that step data object that was injected to get the common data from base step depths, such as the product name in the current page. Same thing here in the cart step depths. So we just added the constructor, um, we have a global variable, and then we utilize that to get the common um, information. Okay. Another cool thing I wanted to show you is how to do multiple verifications. So one approach is to use data tables. So this is a structure available in Cucumber that allows you to keep your feature files organized. In this scenario, we search for TV, and there's multiple results that will be returned. So as opposed to writing a bunch of steps for each one and having the verification method called over and over, I can put it in a table and call the verification method one time and have it ensure that everything is as expected. So to indicate something as a table in your feature file, you simply use the pipe character to serve as column borders. So this is a one column table with two rows. Then within my step definition class, there's the method that corresponds to that step. So notice this method takes a data table, right? So in my method, I simply convert this to a list of strings, then loop through that using the existing page object model to make sure that each value is listed. So by me adding that data table in my feature file and then in the step definition, specifying the argument as a data table, Cucumber will automatically map that to a data table object. Okay, um, you can even use tables to structure objects. So let's say we created a POJO, a plain old Java object to represent a product. So we just have the basic um, the basic fields for a product. Then in your feature file, you can create a data table, but use column headers to map to the properties of the POJO. So notice the first row of the header is the same name as the arguments of the POJO's constructor. 
Then in the step definition class, you can put the argument of the method as the object it is. So in this case, since I have multiple rows of objects, I'm using a list of products. Um, this could very well be a single object if you only use one row plus the column headers. So I then loop through the list of objects and do verification on its properties. All right. So now that we have our additional layers added to the framework, we need to tell Cucumber where everything is so that they can run the test. So notice in the Cucumber package, I added another file. And this file can be called pretty much anything. I call it Cucumber Test Options. And inside this file, I specify that I would like Cucumber to use the pretty plugin for formatting. And then for the glue parameter, I specify where the step definition files live. And then for the features parameter, I specify where the feature files can be found. Um, I also have a setup and a breakdown method to launch and close the browser respectively. Um, and so given this, we can simply run this file and it will run all of the Cucumber tests that it finds. Now remember, we've extended our framework, so we still may have hundreds of tests that are not part of our Cucumber layer. We can still run all of our tests. Um, simply executing on the test folder will run all the tests, the regular ones and the Cucumber scenarios. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of other cool tips and tricks on Cucumber.io. There's even a Cucumber school there where you can purchase additional lessons. So I went through the Cucumber school um, and learned lots of great stuff. It's really well done um, and easy to understand. So I highly recommend uh, checking that out. Um, hopefully today's session helped you realize there's no need to throw away what you've already invested in. Um, you can easily extend your framework to make use of your team's BDD efforts. Now, I left quite a bit of time for questions because um, I didn't want to go off on things that maybe you already know, and I wanted to make sure I address things that you have specific questions about because I know from experience the teams that I've worked with um, typically have uh, questions that are directly related to the stuff that they're working on. So. Uh, Smita, if you want to, I'm ready for questions. Uh, I don't think at this moment we have any, but uh, I'll just uh, probably give them 15 more minutes to let you go ahead. And maybe just before we are about to end in the last 10 minutes, we can ask again. Okay, there are a couple of questions, it seems. I'm just trying to see if I can see them. Okay, there are some coming up. All right. So, uh, can I read them out to you, Angie? Sure. Yeah. So, is it uh, the first one is, is it good practice to have multiple assertion in a step definition? That's the first one. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, so within a step definition, so let's say, for example, your um, feature file, I think we had an example here, actually. Let's see. Um, your feature file says something like um, the following product should be returned, right? And uh, with that, I might, or let me go to this one. Yeah, so the following product should be returned. If we look at this second one right here, we see that we have name, original price, and current price. So those are three different things that I want to verify within an object. So I'm listing what I expect those values to be. And then within this one uh, verification method, I then have three different assertions here that asserts on the name and the price, the original price and the current price. So if they're closely related, then I don't see 
the harm with that. Um, like I said, you want to kind of push the details down. So within your feature file, you may have a way of saying um, the values should be X, Y, Z or whatever. And you don't want to kind of list every single thing out because then your feature file is becoming cluttered. So in pushing those details down, it may get to the point where you are doing multiple assertions within a single method. Okay. Uh, there is a related question. Uh, can the Cucumber step definition files be maintained according to the pages in the applications rather than the functional areas? Hmm. Yes. So um, this is up to you how you manage that. It's, I think that's a good idea, too, to map it to um, the pages within your application so you have a nice correspondence between your page object model design and your cucumber design. Um, so that's perfectly fine. For me, I like to uh, do it per feature area just because if I ever want to see like how many scenarios do we have around a certain feature, I can easily pull that up. So remember these feature files also serve as like living documentation of um, the scenarios and how the feature should behave. So if someone were to ask like what do we have around search, um, I can easily pull that up. Um, in your example where you're tying it to the page object, um, it's still kind of related, so you probably still would have, like, all of your search stuff in that search feature file because it's related to that search page. So that might kind of work about the same way. Um, so suddenly now I have 10 more questions, so I'll quickly okay. try to ask them and we could quickly respond to them. Uh, our we have dear friend, Jim... Peter, don't rush them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so our okay, friend okay. Jim Hayes asks, Angie, Hi, doesn't this process uh, cause a lot of extra methods being built for similar actions on objects? And how would you build out methods that are more generic in approach? Yeah, so um, what I've seen, Jim, is a lot of times people will make one method per step, which is, you know, that's what we're doing, but that step is so um, specific that the method only does like one action. And so in those cases, I don't see a lot of reuse and people are constantly adding additional step definitions and methods to uh, go with those steps that they have. So that's why I use things like the variables and try to parameterize the methods in a way that makes them more reusable. So using that approach, I found that I don't have to make um, as many methods as I used to back when it was I was doing it much more specifically. So you can get really creative with these regular expressions and um, anyone can go online and kind of look up how to use the regular expressions, but you can make them vary quite a bit in, uh, in a way that is very flexible and allows for reuse with your methods. But yeah, that's definitely something to consider and make sure that you're not um, overdoing it because I see that's where a lot of people kind of get frustrated. It's like, especially when testers are adding like these click steps, click this and then click this and then click this and you have like a click stream in your feature file and you then have all of these different methods that are using the, the clicks and you have to have a bunch of global variables to kind of make this stuff uh, span across these methods and it gets really cumbersome. Uh, there are a couple of questions around uh, presentation being downloaded. So yes, the entire webinar is being recorded. You can look at it. Uh, at softwaretestpro.com. Uh, then there are a couple of questions. Yeah, on and tools. I'll make these slides yeah. um, public right after this. So if you see the URL right there, and I'll give them to uh, STP so that they can add them as well. But yeah, if you go there, you'll be able to download them. That'll be great. Uh, there are a couple of questions which I'm going to put together, which are all around tools. So for example, uh, I believe, one of the question is, 
So Shaul asks, Cucumber is your tool of choice for BDD. What are the other available ones? Then Prasad asks on the same line, can we build BDD with Python? And Bhaskaran asks, how Cucumber is unique from JBehave? Yeah, so all of those tools um, are fair game. There's sorry, sorry to interrupt, Angie. Uh, there's one from Jason who says, have you seen teams be successful with this kind of framework flexibility using dynamic languages like JS Ruby? JS Ruby. Um, I haven't seen anyone use JS Ruby um, with BDD. Not to say that it's not possible or that they won't be successful. I don't really think that the programming language matters much as long as you structure it in a clean way. Um, the other tools, I I can't speak very much to them. So Cucumber is the one that I've used the most extensively. Um, Specflow I know is very similar, and that's for .NET. Um, of course, there's JBehave and some of the other ones that you all have mentioned. Um, I don't really, I can't say with confidence because I haven't used them extensively other than like, like, you know, maybe a little quick demo. Cucumber is the one that I've used in real life and real projects um, quite extensively. And so I can vouch for this one. Um, then there is a lender one which says uh, from Metli, it says, how can we pass values generated in a particular scenario to another scenario? So what she's trying to say is, say if scenario one generates an order ID uh, that's generated in the application, how can she pass the same, uh, the how, how can she pass this value as input to the second scenario? Right, so my advice to you is to keep your scenarios independent. So when you link them that way, um, you're, you're causing this dependency between them, which is not really a good practice of clean code, um, especially test code. Um, I'm not even sure if there's a way to do that. I guess you can like store it somewhere and then retrieve it later, but really you're kind of working around a bigger issue there. Um, you want to make these scenarios independent. Now what you do want to do is maybe share data of variables between the steps within a, a single scenario. So um, that's what I went over today with having the variables to be global. And so you have one step that maybe sets that variable and then the next step utilize that variable's value or change it or whatever. Um, so that's how you do it within a scenario. Um, I really don't recommend making multiple scenarios dependent upon one another. Okay, Jim just uh, Jim just sent some comments to it saying you can store it to a file or database Yeah. and have to build the database tables and functions to find the data via keyword pair. That's right, what he yeah, so, yeah, that's what I say. You can, you can persist this somewhere, but yeah, it's kind of working around a bigger, bigger issue there. Yeah. Uh, Joseph is asking, will Cucumber BDD work well for embedded development environment with C and C++ C++ source code too? So there's Specflow for um, the C languages. Um, it's very similar to Cucumber. Um, so that's one that you can use. Okay. Uh, Kalyani is asking, we are experiencing less pass percentage when we run tests through Jenkins. Do you have any reason why this is happening? Is this uh, BDD related, like Cucumber, or just generically with Jenkins? She hasn't mentioned it, but in a separate question, she's saying that in BDD framework, do we have any documentation in using Cucumber, uh, Jerkin language, uh, other than the official website of Cucumber? Um, yeah, so they have some pretty good documentation. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone who... Yes. Uh, um, sorry to interrupt, Angie. She just re replied. She said, yes, it's a BDD. BDD with okay. Jenkins. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you can, contact me um, offline for that one. So it sounds like something specific to your environment. I don't know if it's like maybe 
maybe they're flaky or whatever, but I want to give some more details about your situation and um, help you figure that out. Okay. Raven is asking, how do you manage massive amounts of scenarios? Do you use any tools to help manage what already exists and what is added? So the way I do it is basically just with my organization structure of the files. So keeping those um, like maybe like we talked about divided by the functional area or by the pages of the application, things like that kind of help me manage it. I did have um, a situation where a manager, um, because these were being checked into like the source code repository, they weren't available in the traditional test case management tool, right? So where you used to write your test cases um, in some test case management tool, now you're writing it in actual code. So there was like this kind of disconnect between them and the manager had a hard time as far as tracking what we had and what we didn't have. Um, there's some test case management tools, like I think QTest has something that'll help you like plug these into um, your issue tracking system and things like that. So it's more kind of agile friendly and allows for collaboration um, and that sort of thing. But when your team adopts BDD as an approach and as a process, um, it should be understood that you're writing your tests in a different manner now. We're no longer having testers go off by themselves and write these test cases in the test case management tool that no one has access to. It's now more a collaborative effort between multiple parties, and this is the format that we're going to use uh, to track the scenarios now. So a little bit of process, and also you may want to consider um, using tools that foster collaboration. Mm. Tim Leon asks, do you incorporate data-driven testing for defining your listing of the then expected results, like then in quotes, for listings? Um, yeah, I've seen it. So I've not done it much, but I've seen where um, teams will have like a, a file sheet, uh, maybe like Excel or something like that to put a bunch of different um, data variations of what they want to use to drive a scenario. And um, they use, you know, you can get pre pretty creative with this stuff. Like, for example, in your um, feature file, you might want to add a line that says, and read data from uh, XYZ file and then have your code actually open that file and get whatever data you need to get out. Um, so I've seen that. Um, also, there is a like scenario outline featuring Cucumber. So you can look at cucumber.io for that, where um, I have used this a lot, where I have multiple um, different variations that I want to use but the same scenario. So instead of making a whole bunch of scenarios, I just write a scenario outline that specifies this is the scenario and I use um, like variables to um, then replace with the data that I want. So I can outline like all the data that I want and it just basically loops through and runs that scenario for each of those data points. Mm -hmm. And Diego is asking, are you um, are you adding complexity if you use spec flow rather than Cucumber? Like um, in a .NET shop, it might probably make more sense to be aligned with the dev team, especially if a QA team doesn't uh, account with the senior test automation developers. It seems to have more variety in Cucumber frameworks uh, rather than spec flow. So what would be your advice being Cucumber where more information is available or stick with spec flow to have better support with the development team? So it really depends on, and this is more of a language question, so before you can decide on which one of these to do, um, you would have to decide on the language. And I don't know if that's the, the basis of the question. Um, if you are using uh, one of the C languages, then you 
you need to use spec flow. So that's the one that goes with that language. So you don't really have a choice as far as spec flow versus cucumber. Um, the cucumber one is more the JVM. Um, however, if your question is like, which language should I go with? Um, should I align closely with the dev? It really depends. My stance um, from my experience has always been that the automation is typically uh, more catered to from like a, a dedicated automation engineer or testers who are doing automation. There are some shops where developers do help out and they do automation. If that's the case, then yes, it may make sense to align your language with what the developers are using. But I caution you to be realistic about this. So look at the development team. Look at the culture there. Are they really going to help with this effort? So I've, I've had a a couple of cases where the, we've uh, chosen the language based on what the developers are using because, yeah, we want to be more collaborative and um, this will allow them to help us out. But then they don't help us out because they're more focused on their uh, feature development, the new feature development. And so we are now doing a language that we're not very comfortable with and we've adjusted to allow for collaboration with a partner who is not collaborating. Um, so, you know, you kind of get yourself in an awkward situation as far as your language. So my advice is just to look at the situation, be realistic about your team and your culture. If developers are uh, very much into testing and are very much um, supportive of helping drive the automation, then sure, um, it might make sense to align your language with them. But if they're not, then I would choose which, which is more uh, familiar to your automation engineers. OK, uh, that makes sense. Uh, Anne says, do you incorporate test-driven development in your coding techniques? Yes, I do, um, even with the, the test automation. So I start off by. Um, writing out my tests and whatever functionality that I need to be there. So I'll go ahead, like if you saw in the presentation, I had some methods that um, they weren't there yet, but I already coded the test to expect that method to be there. And so I allow that to kind of not compile and be read. And then I go ahead and create my, um, my method within my framework that adds the functionality that I need to make that test pass. So I've written about this on my blog, um, angiejones.tech, um, and I also have a Tech Beacon article that goes into more detail as well about how I use uh, TDD to drive automation. We have Rishi here, he has got three questions. The first one is, if the steps are not detailed, wouldn't it be easy to miss steps? And then he says, why is Excel Sheets not used with BDD? And then he finally is saying, um, can BDD be extended to use, uh, to be used for continuous integration testing, more like regression? Okay, so first one was with the steps. Um, so um, this is a common, no, I got it. So the yeah. first one is about um, if we don't have the details, won't we miss something? So I've seen this mostly happen when people are not doing BDD as it was prescribed to be done. And um, I'm not like the BDD police by any means. However, there is an advantage to doing it the way that it was designed to be done, which is by having the three amigos to discuss. Um, I would even go as far as to argue that maybe there needs to be a fourth amigo there, and that's whoever's doing your automation if that person is not the tester or the developer. So in my case, I'm an automation engineer. 
and I also work with the testers and I work with the developers. So I would need to be like that fourth amigo with the business analyst to um, be in the discussions around the scenario. So I've had cases where the testers, um, they maybe they're doing BDD with the three amigos, right? And they're the representation for tests. So they discuss this stuff and everyone understands how the scenario should behave. Um, and the implementation stuff is also kind of understood as well, right? However, then that test person is not the person doing the automation, neither is the development person. So they hand this scenario off to some automation engineer who is not present in those discussions. That's where you may trip up and get into the case of, okay, I don't know what this step means or how do I drill down into this? And so that's where there's a lot of um, kind of headache um, and testers then start resourcing to uh, adding those clickstream steps again, which then becomes tedious for the automation engineer as well. So I would recommend having them to come and be a part of the BDD discussion originally so that they understand. Or in cases where that's not possible, you may need to have kind of another session to with between the tester and the automation engineer to kind of make sure they understand what these scenarios mean and how to get to what they need to get to to be able to implement them. All right, so that was the first question. The second question was about Excel spreadsheets with BDD and why they aren't used. Um, I have seen them used. There's no rule that they can't be used. You can add a step within your feature file that says read uh, my Excel spreadsheet. I'm not a huge fan of using Excel spreadsheets, but I do understand that there's some context where that makes sense. And um, you certainly can use it within BDD. And then the final question, to me, the remind me. Yeah. So the final question was, can BDD be extended to be used for continuous integration testing, something like regression? Something like regression, right. So um, that's a, that's, I'm really glad you asked that question. So Cucumber, from what I understand, or BDD in general, from what I understand, was um, designed more for like acceptance test layer. That's how you're able to get these scenarios really short. I have seen teams who um, attempt to utilize BDD for more end-to-end uh, -end or regression flows. And usually those give them more problems because the scenarios become really long um, and it becomes hard to manage and understand like what is it that we're testing here and um, where your verification points should be and things like that. So it wasn't designed for that. However, there's nothing that's like, there's no law to stop you from doing it if you're able to do it in a manageable way. It won't be easy though. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Samila? Yeah, there are tons of them as I expected and we have last two minutes. So we'll try to cover a few of, more of them and then maybe We'll, we'll see what we can do with the rest. We can All probably right. send them to you and you can respond. So Sean asks about, um, I think his first question was pretty much similar to what you just responded. It was how can we use feature files for regression testing in a deployed environment? So yeah, uh, you kind of covered that. The second one is, does Cucumber work with client-side frameworks like React or Angular? Um, there are some um, ones for, like, if you're going to use JavaScript for your um, your test language, yes, there are. There is support for that as well. Cucumber JS. Cool. So, um, yeah, then there is another one coming up from Diego. Um, I think I just missed it. All right, he was just saying thanks for it. Yeah, there is one from Ravindra Sharma that says, we don't have multiple background capability in Cucumber framework. There can be only one background per feature file. As a workaround for the same, what would you recommend? Yeah, so we didn't talk about backgrounds in this uh, presentation, but yeah, there's a way you can add a background and that background basically will run for each scenario that's in that feature file. 
the background needs to be something that is common across them. So I, this question is, well, what happens when you need like another background? Um, that's just not the way that the tool works. Uh, what I do in those cases is I make my background generic. If there's something that's not specific to a scenario, like I would have need to change it for that scenario, then that means it's not part of the background anymore. So I start um, kind of stretching it out and putting them in the scenarios where they need to be and keeping the background common to all of the scenarios. Okay, so we take one final question that's from Brad that says, uh, there are some misconceptions on BDD. One who is uh, one of this is who writes the specification. So can you address this misconception? Yes. So the uh, BDD was designed to be uh, for people to participate. The three amigos. So that would be your developer, your tester, and your business analyst. And um, so those three are ideally communicating about the feature and the scenarios that they should develop. And um, then you can lead that meeting with the scenarios kind of outlined. And from there, go ahead and do your automation if that's what you want to do. Um, the misconception, so a lot of teams are not getting that buy-in. So I wrote a, a blog post about this actually when you're doing BDD and you're kind of talking to yourself. Um, what I'm saying about that is that a lot of teams don't get that buy-in from everyone on the team. So testers end up doing it themselves, doing BDD like all alone by themselves, maybe them and some automation person. And a lot of the BDD purists are saying that this is not the right approach and they're kind of slapping your wrist and thinking that you're naive. And so my argument in the blog post was that people are not naive. They realize that this is not the pure form of BDD. However, you kind of work with what you have. If other people don't want to participate, then they don't want to participate, but people want to have the advantage of automation for BDD. So um, actually the creators of Cucumber, one of the creators looked at uh, the post and so he took it as a to-do um, to kind of help drive this collaboration forward um, in his presentations and things like that. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we'll have more collaboration between the three amigos. Um. So there are quite a few compliments and more uh, questions, Angie. What we'll do is probably share them with you, and okay. we can also publish all your responses on Software Test Pro for these uh, uh, attendees to look at them. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. And here's my contact information, um, Angie Don't Stop Tech. You can send me an email through that site. Or I'm on Twitter, of course, at TechGirl1908, and you can send me a tweet or DM me um, if you want to discuss anything else. That has been great, Angie. Thank you so much for your time today. It was very sure. insightful. Thank you for having me. Absolutely pleasure. So it was a very in insightful session with lots of practical tips and key information and understanding on basics of approaching BDD um, and automation and how to actually get started with it. I'm sure our attendees found it very informative and useful. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in Washington. Yes. And attendees, you did. Yeah, attendees, you did well asking so many questions. So, so everyone, yeah, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for joining in, and more importantly, really, thanks for being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and for the whole group. So stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon. And if you haven't signed up yet for the upcoming webinar, which is What is Agile Testing Anyway? by Pradeepa Narayan Swami on 12th July, the link is up for registra registration at softwaretestpro.com. So go ahead and register. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. See you all in Washington.